This podcast is brought to you by the Pro Bono Institute. PBI is a nonprofit organization that supports, enhances, and helps to transform the pro bono efforts of major law firms, in house corporate legal departments, and public interest organizations in the U.S. and around the world. Welcome to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm your host, Nihad Mansour, Assistant Director of the Law Firm Pro Bono Project. Today I'm speaking with Access to Justice leaders Tony West, Karen Lash, and Mehej Wayed, who all played an integral part in leading the Department of Justice's first Office for Access to Justice, which was formally established in 2016, serving as the primary office in the executive branch focused on supporting indigent defense and civil legal aid for low-income and vulnerable communities. Tony West is the Senior Vice President, Chief Legal Officer, and Corporate Secretary at Uber, and former Associate Attorney General of the United States, and in that role also served as former co-chair of the White House Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable, commonly known as LAIR. Karen Lash and Meha Jawaid are independent access to justice experts, and both are former acting directors and deputy directors of the United States Department of Justice's Office for Access to Justice and former executive directors of LAIR. Recently, there have been a number of exciting announcements by the President and Attorney General on relaunching the work of the former Office for Access to Justice. Tony West oversaw the work of the Office for Access to Justice when he was Associate Attorney General of the United States during the Obama administration. And he shared more about why federal activity on access to justice is important. I was very happy to hear about both the president's interest in in rekindling the legal aid interagency roundtable layer, as well as the attorney general's desire to to stand up or restand up the office for access to justice. Look, I think this is a an area where federal leadership can be uniquely important and uniquely impactful. You know, the need for for civil legal aid is so large in our country. We've got a hundred million people by some estimates every year, suffering from um, civil justice problems. And and we know that that need stretches far beyond the capacity of any one state. So it's really appropriate for the federal government to exercise leadership here, to be able to to fill some of the access to justice gaps in policymaking, in resources that can be provided to, to those organizations and those institutions that provide justice to people who need it. You know, without federal leadership, you have a a very fragmented approach to to really resolve access to justice issues. So having a federal lens, having a federal presence here, I think really does make a difference. When you look at the individual states, funding at the state and local levels is, is simply not adequate to meet the need when it comes to access to justice. And it's really on the state and local levels where most of the access to justice dramas play out. You're talking about, you know, someone who's who's trying to keep their, their house, someone who's trying to, to get access to their health care, or someone who's trying to, to keep their child. These are these are you know very basic human needs and Having access to, to civil justice is something that is, is really necessary to be able to, to meet those needs. You know, we, we know, too, that, you know, all too often, who gets access to civil justice depends more on what you can afford as opposed to the, the merits of your case. You know, it's not the way it should work here in the United States of America. And we know that there's bipartisan support for access to justice. You've got over 80% who agree that access to justice in a democracy is a right, not a privilege. So all of that suggests that there is a healthy and important role for the federal government to play when it comes to ensuring access to justice for all Americans. The former Office for Access to Justice had notable accomplishments. Tony shared some highlights. The Access to Justice Office is near and dear to my heart. When I was the Associate Attorney General, some of the work of which I was most proud emanated from the Office for Access to Justice. At that time, it reported 
to the office of the Associate Attorney General. And it was led by Maha Jawed and Karen Lash. And ATJ, as, as we affectionately called it, ATJ was the only executive branch that was dedicated, really dedicated to planning, uh, coordinating policy initiatives that were aimed at expanding access to civil legal aid. The only executive branch office dedicated to improving criminal indigent defense. And that office was so essential to, to building community partnerships, partnerships that really enhanced DOJ's own credibility on critical justice issues. It was instrumental in launching and leading the groundbreaking Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable, LAIR, which was a White House initiative, but the energy and the impetus and really the idea of it came from ATJ. Karen Lash led that work when, when we were there at the Justice Department. And through Lair's work, Lair was our effort to make sure that the federal agencies were, were meeting their own missions by including ways to increase access to legal justice, civil legal justice in their work and coordinating all of that and making sure that we were effective on a federal level, on an interagency level, when it came to providing access to civil legal justice in the course of discharging other federal priorities, that wouldn't have happened without Lair. You know, I think uh, ATJ was instrumental in helping us to fight the criminalization of property. You know, when, when folks are incarcerated simply because they're poor, they can't afford bail, that comes with it a, a whole host of secondary and third order consequences that can really lead to a downward spiral and can wreck someone's life. And in doing that can wreck a family and can harm a community. You know, people who are incarcerated because they can't make bail often lose their jobs. They may lose their housing. They may be forced to abandon their education. They and their families may sink deeper into poverty. And one of the things in the Office for Access to Justice did so well was that it really worked to ensure that in our criminal justice system, everyone received equal protection of the law, regardless of their means, regardless of their personal wealth. For instance, one of the things that they did was to ensure that we could get greater clarity from state and local courts regarding their legal obligations with respect to the enforcement of certain court fines and certain court fees for criminal defendants. And so trying to separate the idea of poverty from criminal conduct, because in our system, you are still innocent until proven guilty, trying to make sure that people were getting fair and equal access to a fair due process when it came to these issues. That was something that ATJ did and did well. We were pleased to see that the newly released presidential memorandum says the DOJ will explore pro bono legal services among the access to justice policy initiatives it considers. Tony was responsible for the issuance of the DOJ-wide pro bono policy in 2014 calling for Department of Justice attorneys to do pro bono work. He shared more about what led him to help strengthen the department's pro bono policy. Well, sure. Listen, I think service in the Justice Department is one of the highest forms of public service one can give. And, and I was really privileged to be able to work with so many dedicated public servants at the Justice Department. That's true. It's also true that we have a huge unmet need for legal services in this country. And it's a need that is based primarily in poverty or lack of access to resources. And for me, that was one of the reasons why we have a Department of Justice. That was one of the reasons we, we all went to work at that place was because we believed that part of our mission was to make sure that we were ensuring that our actions added to creating an environment where everyone could be treated fairly and could be treated justly. 
in my office, both when I was the head of the civil division and then when I was the associate attorney general, I had over my fireplace a portrait of Robert Kennedy, who personified for me both the mission of the Justice Department. We were in a building, Main Justice actually bears his name. But, you know, his his sentiment and the way that he approached public service, you know, one of the things he, he said the night he died 51 years ago was that we are a great country, we are a compassionate country, we are an unselfish country. And that sentiment is one that really, if you're trying to be true to it, means that, you know, public service, again, one of the highest forms of public service, I think, is being a Department of Justice lawyer, but also doing what you can to meet the unmet need of access to justice, even as a Department of Justice lawyer, that is part of your duty as well. And so, you know, we wrote the pro bono policy, which encouraged the department attorneys to devote 50 hours a year to pro bono service. We started that in the civil division when I was the head, and then we were able to expand that to the entire department. But I do think it's a it's an important part of your service and your efforts to really live up to the to the mission of the department. And, you know, it's something that I've continued now, even in, in the private sector, it's something I've continued at every job I've had since the Department of Justice of having a pro bono policy for the attorneys that I manage. We have it here at Uber uh, as well, uh, because it, it is an important part of, of what it means, I think, to be a lawyer. As former executive director of LAIR, Karen Lash was very excited to see the presidential memorandum restoring DOJ's access to justice function and reinvigorating LAIR. I am extremely excited to not only see the presidential memorandum and the really concrete things it's directing, but just to see federal leadership on access to justice restored. It's kind of like the Phoenix rising with all of the hope and renewal that that represents. Early in the life of the Justice Department's Office for Access to Justice, or ATJ, we identified the big idea animating LAIR. And that is there are lots of federal programs aimed at getting people housing, health care, employment, education, and improving family stability and public safety. And many of them will be more effective and efficient and fair. They'll get better outcomes for the people the programs aim to help when they include legal services alongside the other services already being provided. So our boss, Tony, was an immediate champion and you're nothing in the federal government without committed leadership, which we had in Tony along with the White House Domestic Policy Council's Tanya Robinson, and they both served as our co-chairs in the early years. And we also had the blessings of Attorney General Holder and Domestic Policy Council Director Cecilia Munoz, who really endorsed the whole idea and told us to go forth and, and do as much as we could. So with those powerhouses backing up the whole endeavor, we worked with 22 federal agencies to identify those programs and policies and outreach activities that didn't include civil legal aid, but they could, meaning they have authority to add legal aid and that they should because the research says it's gonna work better, we'll get better results. So, for example, your podcast listeners probably know that employment goes up and recidivism goes down when people with a criminal record get their record expunged and driver's license reinstated. So that means all federal job training and workforce development programs should include civil legal help for people with a criminal record. And similarly, how we know that health improves and healthcare costs go down when people get legal help to address their health harming civil justice problems. So let's make sure the VA's medical facilities and our nation's network of community health centers work to embed legal services through medical legal partnerships. 
So those are just a couple of examples of how Lair 1.0 used its marching orders. So Lair was originally launched and staffed by uh, ATJ in 2012. I'm happy to say that its success got attention of the White House and President Obama who issued uh, the first presidential memor memorandum elevating it to a White House initiative in 2015. And a November 2016 first, well, we used to say only, but now we know there will be many more. The first annual report to the president reporting on Lair's activity was published, which I'm pleased to say is still on the Justice Department's website. Karen explained what the presidential memorandum calls for that's the same and different from the first iteration of Lair and DOJ's access to justice work. So the full title of the presidential memo is really descriptive. And that is, it's called the Memorandum on Restoring the Department of Justice's Access to Justice Function and Reinvigorating the White House Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. So as suggested, it does two things that are distinct, but they're interconnected. So first it directs Attorney General Garland to expand the Justice Department's planning, development and coordination of access to justice policy initiatives and asks him for a report to the president describing the department's plan to expand its access to justice function and do that within 120 days. So if I've done the math right, that's no later than September 15th, we'll all know a lot more. Second, it relaunches Lair as a White House initiative and builds on, but expands on the 2015 President Obama presidential memo. So there's a lot of the same activities, including improving coordination among federal programs to make them more effective by including legal services, developing policy recommendations and advancing research and best practices, and assisting the US with implementation of goal 16 of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Goal 16 is the one that has to do with access to justice and in ATJ and Lair 1.0, that work was really brilliantly led by Maha in the before time. The presidential memo also adds some new agencies and directs that the first Lair report, which is also due mid-September, has to focus on COVID in uh, civil and criminal justice. Now, later that day, the presidential memo came out in the morning on May 18th, and then later that day, Attorney General Garland he posted his equally powerful statement in response, making it clear that he shares President Biden's views and he really sees this work as part of a response to his deep concerns about the public's fractured faith in rule of law and doubting if the government really seeks equal justice for all. So, then he directs the Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco with the Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta to consult with the heads of all the DOJ components and other stakeholders, which is including outside advocates, to come up with a plan for not only restoring but expanding DOJ's role in leading access to justice policy across the government. I especially love Attorney General Garland's close, which made me kind of shed a tear because he said, I look forward to revitalizing our important efforts on this front and to ensuring that access to justice remains an enduring part of the Justice Department's work, which to my ears sounds like it's a nod to the prior administration shutting down the office, an office that we all thought would be a permanent fixture in the department. The presidential memorandum makes the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on access to justice in both the criminal and civil legal systems a priority for Lair. Karen serves as a practitioner in residence and director of American University's School of Public Affairs Justice and Government Project. And she mentioned the federal efforts she's seen aimed at addressing COVID-19's impact on access to justice. 
this terrible crisis has made clear to legions of state and local policymakers that they really need civil legal aid partners in their response, recovery, and, and resilience stages. They need us to keep people housed, help them get benefits and jobs and stop illegal debt collection and scams and address a rise in domestic violence and that they really have to have civil legal aid in the mix. So it's key that President Biden, who has made pandemic recovery and all hands on deck imperative, that he notes in the presidential memo that the pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing inequities in our justice systems and says it should be the focus of Lair's first report and Lair meeting. And they're gonna have a lot of grist to work with. In my justice and government project at American University where thanks to my private foundation funders who believed in the Lair model and supported me in taking those executive branch strategies and good government message to state and local governments, I've seen an enormous amount of activity that flows directly from the federal government, both through the CARES Act and especially the American Rescue Plan Act. So with that new funding and new programs and the CDC's eviction moratorium, it's really helped propel the right to counsel movement in housing where we all know a tiny percentage of tenants have lawyers, while almost all landlords do and the implications of that. It's inspired new collaborations between courts and legal aid and IOLTA foundations to create eviction diversion programs. It's ignited both courts and legal aid programs to embrace technology to provide services and access to self-help. And state housing departments and other agencies, I, I really, I don't, I've seen the before and after. <laughs> they just haven't engaged with legal aid like they are now. It's, it's like it's a new day for engaging civil justice system partners to address all of these social justice problems. So, and really all of that was spawned by the federal response to the pandemic. It means Lair and ATJ 2.0 will have a lot to do, but also a lot to build on, to make good on the commitments in the presidential memorandum and Attorney General Garland's memo as well. All right, ATJ 2.0 it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I, that's how Maha and I talk about it. It's, it's not like it's caught on. Yeah, it'll catch on. I believe in it. Easy shorthand. <laughs> The presidential memorandum continues to task Lair with helping to implement Goal 16 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mehej Wayed, having served as the U.S. government's subject matter expert for the U.N. Sustainable Development Goal 16, explained why it's important for Lair's work to have a direct connection to the SDGs and Goal 16 in particular. The UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is also commonly known as the Sustainable Development Goals, is often seen as a tool to support development agencies in their work, like the US Agency for International Development and the UN Development Program. But it has an important characteristic of being a universal framework to end extreme poverty while taking climate change into consideration. And that's important because that means it's also a tool for domestic practitioners working to tackle poverty to organize their work. And so the inclusion of access to justice reflects the recognition that there is no solution to poverty without justice. And so by tasking this large interagency effort that primarily includes agencies focusing on domestic issues with helping to implement Goal 16, the president makes clear that the US will practice what it preaches to others. In addition, the SDGs come with a set of measures that each country should report on, and also the opportunity for countries to develop their own measures at the national level. So again, by linking the interagency work with Goal 16, agencies have a mandate to consider the data they collect in a way that helps to develop national level indicators that makes it even clearer that what the justice gap is, and perhaps even more importantly, the ways that the federal engagement can help close it. 
Linking the largely domestic interagency effort with this international framework also allows the US to signal to the global movement on justice that they are once again a member of it. And so over the past few years, the US has really pulled back in this work where countries and non-governmental organizations, civil society actors are working to exchange best practices and innovate together. So again, by including goal 16 in this newer presidential memorandum, it, it does demonstrate that the US is committed to returning to this global platform. And in fact, this is, this is something that's been longstanding with the US government under the leadership of Tony West, the US engaged with the global justice community on, for example, strengthening the right to counsel in criminal proceedings when he oversaw the former Office for Access to Justice when he was associate. And one last point, this creates goodwill across the globe. Not only does such engagement provide opportunities to showcase our successes, it can create genuine dialogue when government representatives speak candidly and share the difficulties they encounter in addressing needs. In the same way that human rights and the SDGs are universal, solutions to ensure that they are protected and implemented should also be seen as universal and adapted across borders when appropriate. If we take a step back to look at the global movement on access to justice, there are analogs to the Office for Access to Justice in other countries. Meha shared insight into how well-established this approach is to improving access to justice. Indeed, there are. And it does seem that some of these offices, also called directorates or secretariats, came into existence around the time that the former U.S. office was launched. They often serve the role as a government's central authority or focal point on access to justice to help organize and coordinate activity across government. So these offices exist across the globe from Canada, our neighbors to the north, where their Department of Justice just launched their office in 2019. And that's the same year when Sierra Leone began undertaking steps to also establish their own office. And while the models for these offices vary, they all share a clarity in mission, and that's to serve as the government's access to justice expert, to ensure that innovations in the delivery of justice services are people-centered and responsive to actual needs. The offices can provide a holistic view of justice, advancing both formal and customary, and in the U.S. that would be indigenous systems of justice, and serve as a hub for connecting both subject matter experts from inside and outside of government with access to justice initiatives. We see these offices come together sometimes at the regional level for peer exchanges. For example, the Organization of American States has held meetings for these offices, these central authorities from across the Americas, and the former US office participated in those. And sometimes these offices come together at the global level, such as through the Open Government Partnerships Coalition on Justice, mm -hmm. again, with the goal to provide opportunities for peer exchange that help really advance innovation. One example of what that looks like related to the topic of the day, there's really, there's been growing interest by other countries to replicate the Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. And I know that Karen and I have both engaged in peer exchanges with counterparts in different countries as they're exploring and interested in adapting that model. And that's really exciting. We've seen a lot of interest in the SDGs by the private bar. Meha talked more about the developing role of the private sector in helping to advance Goal 16 in particular. The private sector's role in protecting human rights and aiding anti-poverty initiatives has been rapidly growing over the past couple of decades, and PBI certainly has seen a lot of that and is credited with a great deal of that work with respect to the pro bono community. And with growing expectations from all parts of society for corporations to respond to all stakeholders, not just shareholders, and speak out against injustice, especially in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, the private sector has an increasingly important role to play in creating more just and fair societies. So by connecting their efforts to improve the communities they serve to international activity, private sector actors can increase their impact and inspire peers to do the same. And the SDGs provide such an opportunity. Currently, the SDGs were developed in a multi-stakeholder environment by governments in partnership with civil society, with citizens and the business community. And the SDGs really reflect this recognition that the ambition behind the agenda requires collaboration across society. But while businesses have embraced the agenda and many of its goals, goal 16 has largely been overlooked until recently. So in 2019, when for the first time the UN reviewed Goal 16, every year the UN takes a few goals and goes a little bit deeper on them, private sector engagement tied to the goal began to accelerate. So I'll give two examples. In the US, the National Legal Aid and Defender Association 
working with its longstanding corporate advisory committee, launched a new public-private collaboration to advocate for access to justice policy reform before executive branch agencies, the legislative branch and courts at all levels of government. And the successful partnership has resulted in, for example, letters to Congress from the corporate community, advocating for increased funding for civil legal aid, which of course PBI was a, a critical partner in, and also for public defense, especially in the wake of COVID-19. So connecting this collaboration to the SDGs has prompted creative approaches by corporate legal departments to support the access to justice community in the US. In addition, the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Society launched the new Business Leaders for Justice Coalition, which is creating a space for businesses and the organizations that work with them from across the globe to share their solutions to justice challenges while encouraging others to do more. Thank you to Tony West, Karen Lash, and Meha Jouaid for their thoughtful remarks on the Office for Access to Justice. Be sure to like and subscribe to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all for now, and thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour.